exploring the bizarre. bizarre. Your e-ticket ride into the world of the paranormal. Strap yourself in as we traverse the universe exploring the unexplained. UFOs, UFOs, UFOs ghosts, ghosts, lost worlds, lost worlds cryptozoology, cryptozoology, as well as other dimensions. dimensions. It's time to take back the night. Back the night. Back. Now, your electrifying hosts of Exploring the Bizarre, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. Mm -hmm. Hi, Tim. Wow. I didn't know that you had so many UFO photos in your collection. Oh, wow. I am impressed. Uh, which, what are those there? Well, if you stop breathing down my neck, I'll uh, show you. It's the Trent photos taken by Ma and Pa Kent, as I affectionately call them. They were taken in 1950 in rural McMinnville, Oregon. Huh. I don't know. Do you really think they're real? They kind of look like pie pans from uh, Ed Wood's uh, uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space. Um, why all the fuss over them? Well, they've been analyzed by experts over the years who have said they're the real McCoy. Hmm. They're sort of just simple UFOs, just like the nice folks who took them. You know they have a UFO festival in McMinnville every year to honor the Trents and to celebrate the occasion. Oh, yeah, I've heard about that. The locals and tourists dress up in uh, outrageous alien costumes, and there are floats and cotton candy and music all along Main Street. Ah, I always did enjoy the parade. But you have to watch out for those nasty, fast-moving UFO uh, floats, especially the ones that are driven by the dreaded men in black. Well, maybe uh, maybe we should just go back to the KCOR studios where uh, where we know we'll be nice and safe. Well, I hate leaving McMinnville, but maybe we'll uh, return to their uh, festival when it takes place. Okay, as hey, long as Jim, you buy me cotton, uh, as long as you buy me cotton candy uh, and and, and a, uh, a rubber hot dog. Ugh, ugh. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 well, one one is shape uh, one is shape like uh, the mothership. Of there you go. All right, uh, that sounds good. And and, and, and 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 since you say it looks like a pie pad, uh, maybe they have McMinnville pies. I suppose I don't know. Mm, but pie. Uh, Eddie, you know, I I'm I am I am in my own subtle way, I'm sort of impressed by the photos. Back when I was in UFO seminary school, I mean, back when I was about thirteen or fourteen. Uh, and I was just starting to collect my uh, UFO uh, memorabilia. Uh, there were two things that you could get, at least two things you could get for free. One was a coast, glossy Coast Guard photograph that was taken uh, through a window, I think at a Coast Guard base. It showed three or four uh, lights in the sky over, a, I think, a parking lot. Yeah, and I know the one that, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah you could get that for free by uh, riding to the Coast Guard. And the other one, if you wrote to the McMinnville, I believe it was registered, the newspaper, they would send you a free reproduction of the cover of the newspaper that contained the trend photograph. So that was one of the first things. It was poster size, believe it or not, and it was glossy printed. And I hung it up on my uh, on my wall. And um, I wish I had that uh, today. It would be a real uh, uh, collector's item. That would probably be the closest to the original reproduction of the objects because it was uh, uh, printed in the uh, McMinnville uh, newspaper. So hmm. there you go. Mm, yeah, wow. That's, <laughs> that's yeah, to think that you could get something like that for free. I mean, you know, it's, uh, you can't get anything like that nowadays. <laughs> Not for free. Well, you know, if you write, if you write to us, you could always get something, uh, for free with the, we have the biggest giveaway in all of the paranormal. And what would that be? Well, we get a, give them a free subscription, to the conspiracy journal. Uh, often I hand out, uh, DVDs. I, I mean, uh, we we just uh, and, and occasionally even a free book on on Kindle. I mean, uh, we 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 we've got the we got the what do they call it swag? There you go. Merlin, uh, okay. Oh, hey, lots Merlin. of swag. Yeah, <laughs> and, we, and, and we've got a puppy dog. We're going to give away. 
<laughs> uh, don't say that. People, <laughs> people will be writing in for their free puppy dog. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm with the show. I'm with the show. I'm with the show, Tip. What do we got planned for tonight? Well, um, I'm, I'm really happy uh, because we have with us uh, Caitlin Pop, and she is going to be talking about the uh, the 20th annual uh, UFO festival there in uh, McMinnville, uh, Oregon. Now, Caitlin is the assistant historian at uh, McMenon's, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, correct uh, Historic Hotels, and has been with them for over four years now, having joined the history department just last spring. Now, 2018 was her first time attending the uh, McMenon's UFO Festival in McMinnville, but her interest in UFOs and ufology began at a very early age, growing up within the Star Wars and Star Trek canons. Now, she's always held uh, an innate curiosity in the vastness of space and the possibility that we're not alone in this universe. Her interest lies mainly in experience or stories trying to piece together similarities to prove that there is intelligent life out there somewhere, maybe not here on Earth, but maybe somewhere else out there. So, Caitlin, thank you very much for being with us on Exploring the Bazaar. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, this is, this well, is going to be great. I'm so excited. <laughs> well, you know, this, like I say, this is a, a kind of a, a just a, something I'm, I'm very uh, into. Why don't you tell us, uh, Caitlin, a little bit about the background of the uh, photographs, when they were taken, the circumstances, and a little bit about uh, the trends. Yeah, of course. So, um, you know, what's really lovely about the Trent family and why this has really just fascinated um, the UFO community for, you know, so many years. Is in, you know, 1950, you know, the trends, they were out, you know, on their farm, you know, really regular day for them out in the country in McMinnville, Oregon, you know, the Pacific Northwest in the 1950s, kind of still probably, you know, a pioneer, pioneer town, you know, a, a wild west town, if you will. Um, and, you know, they were just out on their farm you know, doing errands and you know, the uh, Mrs. Trent saw, you know, just something out in the sky, thought it was, you know, weird and you know, called for her husband, you know, go get the camera. And of course they had just one of those, it was film, it was 1950, point and shoot, you know, nothing fancy kind of camera. And, you know, they took a f series of photographs. And you know what is really spectacular about, you know, this whole experience is that they just kind of threw the film just kind of somewhere in storage and they forgot about it for years, you know, until someone brought it up again. And they finally were like, you know, you know let's have someone take a look at these photographs. And, you know, finally it comes out and, you know, we have, they turn out to be some of the most credible, you know, UFO photographs, you know, that we, we have seen in, you know, the last, you know, however many years, just because, as you were saying earlier, so many people, you know, have taken a look at these photographs and tried to disprove them. But, you know, a lot of people generally can't, you know, just, and it's, the beautiful thing about it is they really never wanted anything out of it. You know, they never wanted fame. They never wanted glory and money and that kind of thing. They, again, nearly forgot about the photographs and they were almost lost to time. But, you know, that was kind of something that we think is really extraordinary. Small town Oregon, again, you know, out in the country, middle of nowhere, you know, and then of course they, you know, kind of blows up, you know, on the, you know, the, you know, the Minnesota Gazette kind of blows up on the, you know, the front page there. And then it just becomes, you know, a part of the history of that flying saucer, quintessential, you know, what we want to see from the quintessential flying saucer, you know, image. So it's just something really special. And, you know, 20 years ago, my boss, Tim Hill, who was a historian for McMenamins, uh, we have, you know, we were, he was doing research about a uh, property that we were buying down there in McMinnville um, called the Hotel Oregon. And he came upon these photographs and, you know, he's like, why don't people honor these? Why don't we celebrate this? You know, and that's how the festival was born, you know, 20 years ago. It's just really exciting. And it's just only gone up, you know, from there. And we've only gotten bigger and bigger as the years have gone on. So, it, it, yeah. I understand it is outside of Roswell. It would be the second largest uh, uh, UFO festival in the uh, country. What, what normally is the population of McMinnville in what does it swell to on UFO Festival weekend? <laughs> right. 
You know, so I'm not sure about the actual statistics of the population of McMinnville, but it is definitely a small town community. You know, they have a large farming industry kind of as you get to the outskirts of the city. Um, so I would say it's probably, you know, it's, it's a shame because I just passed the sign the other day. It's probably about 30,000 people or so. Um, so again, not a large town by any means or a large community. Um, and, you know, we bring in probably about another 10,000 or so just for that that festival just for that day specifically um we have you know people who come and stay at our hotel property and you know they stay for the whole weekend and they make a whole weekend out of it and it's wine country so you know it's a really beautiful destination for people to come and visit even if they you know know nothing about ufos or know you know about you know the trend photographs or you know the weekend it's it's just a fun weekend and beautiful wine country in oregon so you know what what's not to love about it now, is the newspaper still in business? You know, um, I don't believe it is. And I, I, I'm i sorry, I should know this. Um, but we do know that they do still own the rights to the photographs themselves. Um, so if you were to take a picture of the whole photo, uh, sorry, they have, a, they have the rights to the like full news print. So if you were to want to reproduce like that full, as you were saying earlier, you know, that poster. Oh, that's that you the, got, one got for, the one I got I for free. The other one I, know, I got for free. And I'm, you, well, you can you see know, how much money they're making on that one. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, uh-huh. I mean, if you were to reproduce that full, you know, front yeah. page, you know, yeah. article, then that would be, you know, something that they, they would get the rights to. But, yeah, the photographs in and of themselves, I believe, are now kind of open, you know, to the oh, public. I get to say, they, yeah, they, they've, they've been used, uh, they've been used, uh, ev- you know, uh, everywhere. There's yeah. no <laughs> doubt about that. They're but, iconic. You know, the, yeah. The, yeah, the interesting thing about the photographs is that they are very simplistic. I mean. Some people say, oh, they're, they're pie plates or it's something that's dangling. Right. I, I think there's a, uh, an electrical uh, a wire, uh, whatever you would call that. Uh, uh, right, uh, going, yeah. Yeah, going, going across the, um, uh, a photograph, except I think the mm-hmm. object appears to be above the wire instead of below it. So that, that kind of uh, uh, does away with that uh, uh, theory. Yeah. Uh, also, too, it just, uh, now, how old were the Trents? Let's see, it's Paul Trent, is that correct? Yes, they were, it's Paul and Evelyn Trent, they were older. Yeah. So they had a, a younger son, you know, that was, li- I believe, yeah. living in um, the uh-huh. house at the time. And, you know, what's really interesting is that, again, they just really sat on you know, the photos for so long and they really never wanted anything out of it. And, and they just kind of forgot about what they saw, which I think is, you know, it's really interesting. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things. So yeah, I've been trying, like, you know, walking back to the farmhouse and, and so we saw some small moving metallic, metallic disc, you know, hanging, uh-huh. you know, kind of out in the Northeast, like around their property and just you yell for her husband as you do. And, and it's, it's funny because we think about this being like a quintessential, you know, UFO sighting, but these stories are what create, you know, mm-hmm. the stereotypical UFO sighting. It's, it's well, the for sure. That create, yeah, the stereotypical UFO sighting. So, um, and it's Paul is the son. So the father claims he like briefly saw, you know, maybe something, you know, in the sky, but it's really beautiful because so many people, you know, have tried to debunk, oh, where there wires, where there's this, but you know, they've tried to do all kinds of, you know, different tests on, you know, the angles of the image. Oh, yes. To the barn, uh, to the, I mean, it's just amazing all the things. And as we were keep talking about, you know, there's been numerous, you know, investigations, you know, people trying to debunk it. And this was, these were taken in 1950, and they still, yeah. you know, haven't been able to. So it's just spectacular, for sure. Well, well, well you know, the, um, uh, was it Life magazine? Did a whole mm-hmm. uh, retrospect uh, on the uh, uh, on the uh, photographs, and I believe they had the sun. What one of the the reasons I suppose that they uh, some people have thought that the saucer was uh, hanging from the uh, uh, overhead uh, 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 electric uh, line there was because exactly. there's a photograph mm-hmm. a, in the uh, magazine of the sun, who's kind kind of tall actually, if I remember uh, in the yeah. photograph. Mm-hmm. Of him call, uh, uh, climbing a stepladder, but I I don't yes. think in all uh, reality, uh, even if he were to hoax a photograph, that he's going to reach the that that wire by climbing up that real rickety looking. <laughs> 
right. little rickety looking exactly. little ladder that he had uh, uh, there. Mm-hmm. Uh, a plus, a plus, the photograph was taken of him on the ladder was taken sometime after the the pictures. I don't know, about a year or two years or, or exactly. whatever. Exactly, more of like it, a it, kind it of was. a publicity kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But, I mean, but what, it, you know, oh, when oh, you try to recreate it, these experiences, you know, that's yeah. where in lies the problem uh-huh. and where people want yeah. to try to poke holes, you know, in the story and in the situation. Yeah. Well, 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 you know, um, I, I went to uh, YouTube uh, uh, today and uh, in fact, I think we'll, uh, there's a little uh, clip we're going to uh, use that's off the you know, Chamber of Commerce or your site or something uh, of people uh, parading around as aliens with a big saucer and it's, <laughs> Kind of trying to get off the uh, the uh, the ground uh, there, but uh, did you ever check to to see if there were other uh, UFO uh, events uh, around that uh, same uh, time? I mean, were the uh, the uh, the trends by themselves, or had other people reported uh, uh, saucers before or after? Yeah, you know that is a really good question. Um, I'm not sure exactly within that same year. Um, I had just actually attended a presentation by one of our speakers this year, Jim Clarkson, who is with Washington, uh, James Clarkson, or Jim Clarkson is with Washington Move On. And, you know, one of the big themes that he you know, really wanted to make certain and make note to the audience was that this time, you know, the 1950s, the Pacific Northwest was really a hotbed for UFO activity. I mean, we had, you know, Kenneth Arnold, you know, further up oh, yes. north, um, you know, uh-huh. obviously the Maury Island, you know, that ended up you know, not being, oh, yeah. you know, a credible, uh-huh. you know, event. But, you know, it's one of those things where this time period, not a lot of real people realize we're all so focused on Area 51. We're so focused on Roswell, you know, but it's one of those things where you don't realize that up in the Pacific Northwest, you know, we have had so many credible sightings here. And it's, you know, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. And especially in that time, there was just something about, you know, the 1950s and kind of that mid-century, you know, that really was a hotbed for UFO activity. Um, And it got the government's attention. And that's something that we're really trying to focus on this year as our theme as well is, you know, it's the government that was really trying, you know, trying to understand what these sightings meant. Um, and I think that's mm-hmm. something that's really interesting. And, you know, the Trent case, again, was just kind of our jumping off point. It was that, it, you know, it, it, is it in, yeah. it, it, is the, uh, are the photographs mentioned or is there an analysis of them in any of the Project Blue Book records? You know, I'd have to look into that. And, you know, that probably would be a question that I'm da- going to die to ask for our um, one of our, another guest we have coming up for the festival, Peter Davenport, oh, yeah. who is with the National UFO Reporting oh, Center. Um, oh, good a long old, time old, old friend, and, you know, old friend of ours. Yeah, but he oh, he's yeah, uh, as much. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's as, uh, as, uh, as well informed as uh, anyone uh, could possibly be in the in the field now. Has anyone ever approached anyone with your uh, uh, group there uh, 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 indicating that they might have witnessed this or or, uh, seen something unusual in the sky around that same uh, period? I mean, uh, often uh, years later, it's uh, kind of like a a crime scene, you know, uh, witnesses uh, might come uh, forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's one of those things again, and the the trends then and them they you know, themselves were you know so not reluctant again, but it just was such an anomaly for them that they took these photos and they're like, yeah, that was weird, you know, what did we just see, you know, and they kind of threw it to the side, and and it was, I mean, of that time in the 1950s, like when you saw a lot of these lights, and again, when we talk about you know the you know Ken Arnold experience. You know, it, he was a pilot and, you know, it was, it's a, and it happens, you know, a lot of the time in today's society, you know, but I can only imagine in, you know, mid-century, no one would want to ever come through or come forward and uh-huh. talk about anything that they had seen. Um, you know, so there's a really great possibility that, you know, someone had come forward and I'm not sure, you know, it was so long ago in 1950s. So who knows if anyone had actually seen that same anomaly, you know, happen or occur yeah. in, the, in the area, in the McMinnville area. Um, but you know, well, it's just such an interesting thing. Yeah, I, I have seen uh, there. There was a uh, an interview uh, posted on YouTube, and and, and I could not uh, find it. Uh, I I searched uh, for it a couple of years ago. But uh, now mm-hmm. it, the uh, the uh, the lady she she lived longer than her than Paul did. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I remember seeing an interview with her. Well, maybe it was the two of them, and I couldn't tell you exactly what year. 
the interview was uh, was done, but uh, there was an interview, and they were sitting, the, sitting, I think, on the front porch. They they always lived in the same spot, right? I mean, they never moved from there, if I recall uh, correctly. That, yeah, that that's was always, correct. yeah, yeah, always was their home. So they were seated in a in a rocking chair. I guess this was you know a couple of years before they uh, both uh, passed away because they were uh, uh, very elderly. And uh, and they told the same uh, exact same uh, you know mm-hmm. story and uh, uh, it seemed uh, credible. They they weren't particularly shy about uh, uh, describing the uh, the event. I guess as it uh, uh, you know as it uh, years uh, went on, it probably became more uh, you know fixed in their in their memory and in their in their lives mm-hmm. as well. And I'm sure they were approached by uh, you know many people to tell the story. Uh, over mm-hmm. the uh, years, do, do you know if the son is still alive? No, um, you know, we don't. We only have contact with a granddaughter currently, who actually uh-huh. still lives in McMinnville, and she is still, you know, kind of, um, you know, she is not willing necessarily to come and, you know, tell the story of her family, but she's definitely, uh-huh. you know, willing to be acknowledged every year. You know, she be kind of, yeah. we ask her every year if she'd like to kind of say th- well, something be, or, you know, to acknowledge. Just, she ought to be on the head float. <laughs> I know. We try to put her in the parade every year. <laughs> and I think yeah, she's only yeah, been in oh the parade God. a couple times. Yeah. Oh, well, she, I know. Well, she it's has been her... that. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's, yeah. that's mm-hmm. good. I, mm-hmm. I, I know you've had Oh, and I yes. Know. We yeah, always save a I spot for them. <laughs> yeah. I, I know you've had uh, Stanton Friedman uh, uh, there mm-hmm. uh, uh, leading the uh, parade. Who who are some of the other people that have uh, showed up in, in the past to, to speak? And who are some of your uh, speakers this year? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, so we're really fortunate. Um, what's kind of people don't really, you know, realize about our festival is although we are small, you know, we are mighty. And, you know, we have been doing this, you know, for, again, for this is our 20th you know, annual. I mean, so it's uh-huh. very exciting. And we've only kind of grown from there. Um, and this year is just going to be, you know, the most spectacular year you know, we can we can think of. Um, so we had um, a lot of, we did a whole uh, Phoenix Lights um, uh, series one year, and that was really exciting. Um, we had um, a whole um, series about the Navajo, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on my, my, the back of my my brain, uh-huh. the tip of my tongue, of course. But um, and then the last year we had two eyewitnesses from the aerial school phenomenon, um, which uh-huh. was just spectacular. We flew one of them in from London, um, uh-huh. and it was just an amazing experience because um, they're now you know young women who are my age. I mean, they're in their you know late twenties, early thirties, and just to have them you know, see, I mean, that was something that's always been fascinating for me is just to talk with eyewitnesses, you know, a lot of these tools. All right, uh, Caitlin, let me, uh, let me stop you. Let me stop you here because we have to go to our bottom of the hour break. So when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Caitlin Pop on Exploring the Bazaar. So stay tuned for more. Back to exploring the bazaar with two of the most electrifying researchers in the paranormal. Your hosts, Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. Welcome back to Exploring the Bazaar. I'm Tim Swartz. Tonight we're talking with Caitlin Pop and the famous 1950 uh, Trent. McMinnville, Oregon UFO photos and the uh, uh, 20th anniversary now of the uh, okay. uh, McMinnville uh, UFO festival. Now, uh, Caitlin, before we had to go to the break, uh, uh, yeah. you were talking about uh, uh, past uh, guests that you've had for the festival. Well, what about this year? Uh, who do you have lined up? Uh, as, uh, as as speakers, and uh, uh, do you uh, have a, uh, um, gosh, what do you call it, the, <laughs> the uh, 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 play, uh, uh, parade uh, festival king or queen <laughs> yet? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, we are ready. Yeah, and are, and are you allowed to say? <laughs> yeah. 
So, um, yeah, for our festival this year, we really went all out. I mean, we have, we brought in the heavy hitters and I am not ashamed to say that it is just going to be the most spectacular festival. And, you know, nationally, internationally, people are very excited about what we're bringing this year. Um, so I'll start off. I mean, we have uh, Jeremy Sebel and we have George Knapp who are coming back again this year. They were here with us last year presenting um, uh, George Knapp, Hunt for the Skinwalker. I guess Jeremy Corbell worked with George Knapp to produce a film, yes. Hunt for the Skinwalker. Um, mm-hmm. So that was very exciting. So we're bringing them back this year, but they brought with them um, just some very exciting guests. And um, so Jeremy Corbell has been working on uh, Bob Lazar Area 51 Flying Saucers. Um, you know, he premiered it, you know, last year. And he is going to be presenting a special screening of the film. And then we will be doing a presentation with Bob Lazar himself. So oh, my. This that, is very well, exciting. And I, I could see why, by all means, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's just gotten the buzz. I mean, this is what you know, we've been tracking, you know, as far as like ticket sales and, you know, people talking on Facebook and people just buzzing about it on the internet. And he has really been getting the most traction, you know, as far as people. It's, he does not speak in public. I mean, this is just a big deal. And he really, after, um, you know, George Knapp, you know, kind of went public with his whole idea of, you know, Area 51 and what he experienced. Um, and he went not in, I mean, not into hiding. I mean, he was still living his life, but he really kind of went into hiding from the UFO community. Um, he got a lot of flack from, you know, the UFO community. And there still is a very big division about whether or not you think Bob Lazar is, you know, lying or whether or not you think he's Incredible. Um, so this is kind of what you know Jeremy Cordell wanted to talk about in his film, um, Area 51 and Flying Saucers. And you know, it's it's really kind of a testament to kind of the things that we like to talk about, you know, in our festival as well. It's it's fun, it's a parade, you know, we have a pet costume contest, you know, we're doing all these fun wine events, but we really you know, want to bring in, you know, the credible witnesses. We want to bring in maybe a little controversy. We want to get people talking and that's, you know, really what Bob Lazar is all about. And, you know, we're, this might be the last time he ever speaks in public. So we really, you know, want to make sure that he tells his story and he's given a platform to tell his story. And, um, you know, that's why we're just really excited about having Bob Lazar come in. Um, So that is just something we're, you know, raving about. You, you know what we mm-hmm. neglected to uh, what we neglected to tell people is what <laughs> is the what are the dates for the festival? Oh yeah, yeah. If you're, you're planning on coming out, um, it is going to be it's Thursday, May sixteenth through Sunday, May nineteenth. So it's just you know this time next week we will be down in McMinnville, Oregon. Uh, you know for our UFO festival, um, and yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun for sure. So every night we'll have kind of like a you know, a grand speaker event, um, and, you know, during Friday, Saturday, we have a few speaker events going, the main speaker events, if you will, kind of going throughout the day. Um, so again, other guests, we are very, very, very excited also, you know, speaking of eyewitnesses, we're bringing in um, retired uh, Commander David Fravor, um, who is an eyewitness for the Tic Tac UFO case. Uh, he was, um, he's a top, was a top gun pilot. He's you know, now retired, but he, you know, was, uh, did a launch off the U.S. Nimitz down, you know, in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of San Diego, and they saw a unidentified flying object, and he, it was 2004, you know, there is now record that has been released, I mean, that has a video of them on these planes, just in, like in awe of what these crafts that they had never, you know, seen before. And they had such clear visibility. Um, you know, it's just a really extraordinary story. So this is actually the first time that retired Commander David Fravor has spoken, like, in public. So this is going to be really big. And we're very excited about this. So not only Bob Lazar, but also David Fravor. I mean, this is, again, you know, the eyewitness, someone who was there, And his story really became public. He was unknown up until the New York Times article that was released in 2017. Um, And so this is something that, you know, we're even to this day still talking about, that the government is, you know, really, and especially the U.S. Navy, they've come encounter with many, many, many UFOs. 
Um, and of course, I can't remember what they call them. They have a specific term for them, of course. But, you know, they come encounter with these things almost every day in their training runs. And, you know, they are out in the skies. They're, you know, they see, they must see all, all day, like all times of, you know, day and night. And, you know, they are admitting that they study and they track these objects, but they will never release you know, specifically release any of, you know, what their findings, which is a shame, but it's interesting. It's a whole turning point. Again, this has been a very, very, very exciting couple of years um, for UFOs and, you know, ufology. And so we're, we're happy to be a part of that. And we really think, you know, again, this tiny little UFO festival, we are, you know, one of the longest running UFO festivals in, in the country, as you were saying. And, I mean, we're excited to kind of be groundbreaking in that way. And we have things that nobody else does. And, then I see you can like, you know, kick back and like have a beer while you're watching, you know, Bob Lazar give his speak. So it's pretty exciting for sure. But um, yeah, it's going to be a big year. We're very excited. Well, it's really, uh, it's kind of fortuitous that uh, you're, you're having the uh, uh, retired Navy pilot come to speak at the festival, considering that just uh, really, what was it just last week, Tim, that there yeah. is this, uh, a lot of press coverage on uh, not only, once again, the uh, the Tic Tac UFO photos, but that the Navy is considering developing a whole different way that uh, pilots uh, are are you know supposed to report their UFO sightings. So, I mean, that's that's great publicity for your festival. We couldn't have planned it any better ourselves. <laughs> Let me just say, I mean, it's just fortuitous that this is, as you said, I mean, it's amazing that this is all happening, and it's just. Within the last few days, we've noticed just such an upflow of just interest about the festival from internationally. I mean, this is just spectacular. It's going to be a thing. We're elated. I mean, it's going to be a fantastic year. I mean, we were excited, but now it's just everyone else is really seeing kind of the work that we're doing and the things that we're bringing. And it's just really validating. And we're very excited for it. And, you know, some other some other guests. Um, we're having, you know, the Maury Island guys, um, you know, come and do called the Maury Island guys. Um, they have names. <laughs> um, you know, it's going to be, you know, really exciting. They're doing this whole, you know, presentation about um, the Maury Island incident. And, you know, that's the idea that we, again, wanted to kind of, you know, talk about is that the Pacific Northwest has been such a hotbed, you know, and also, you know, California, this whole coast, you know, the West Coast, you know, has been such a hotbed for, you know, UFO activity. Um, and so that is just something that's just really exciting. It's something we want to highlight. Um, another thing we're really excited about this year, and it's a little bit different than anything we've really done before. Um, so Daniel Myrick, who may not be a household name, but he is one of the co-directors of the Blair Witch Project, which, you know, everyone remembers being traumatized by. I mean, me as a kid when it came out. Um, he actually, unbeknownst to us, you know, we found out, you know, a little later when he was kind of interviewing people, he was at our UFO festival last year, and he was filming for his new movie called Skyman that he's currently working on. So we asked him, you know, we were like, would you want to come to the festival and, you know, maybe show clips from your, your film? You know, it's not yet released. He has a trailer, and he just graciously accepted. I mean, he's such a nice guy, and we're very excited. So, yeah, Friday night, that's kind of a little bonus event that we tapped on. Friday night, we normally don't, you know, do anything this late, um, you know, but 930 um, on Friday. And the ticket is a little discounted. It's about $10. So if anyone wants to come and see, um, you know, Daniel Myrick is going to be, again, co-director of, excuse me, the Blair Witch Project, is going to be doing, a, you know, a special presentation where he's going to be showing clips that he filmed at our UFO festival, you know, so uh. going, if they were at UFO fest last year, you know, they might be in his movie. It's, it's kind of fun. It's exciting. And, you know, he's going to be doing a little Q and a and showing some clips and, you know, just talking about his film. So we're very excited for that as well. Again, something a little different, you know, more, it's going to be the same format. Scotty man's about this guy who as a kid, you know, witnessed an, an I, you know, UFO, you know, so he himself was an eyewitness and kind of blocked it out. Um, and so it's just going to be a really interesting experience. And again, something that a lot of our guests and, you know, can kind of, kind of relate to that experience of the wonder of are we alone kind of in the universe and that constant searching for that, that answer to that question. So it's a fun year. And again, we're serious about it. And, you know, we have a lot of really interesting and serious topics, but again, that's, the, really the beauty of our festival and why people keep coming back and, you know, presenters, you know, and speakers, you know, and, you know, our guests keep coming back every year because it's just, 
a unique a unique event. It's it's really just special. We we love it so much. So yeah, we're excited for this year. Well, you know how you, much you has got. Oh no! Go ahead, I, I was just going to say, you, you know, the uh, you mentioned the uh, the Navy's interest uh, interest in the subject. Well, the the yeah. Navy has actually shown over the course of the years uh, perhaps as much, if not more, interest in the uh, in, in UFOs uh, than the uh, Air Force uh, even. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, we have a um, a special edition of the uh, of a book called uh, "The Case for the uh, UFO." Um, by Dr. the late astronomer, the Dr. Uh, M.K. Uh, M. K. Jessup. It's the uh, Vero edition. And uh, back in the, uh, I guess, Tim, when was the book published? Like around 1955 or 56, I think, right? Uh, 56, well, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. The, uh, one of the uh, uh, companies that the, uh, Air, uh, the Navy was doing uh, a business uh, with got a hold of uh, an annotated version of the case for the uh, ufo where uh several uh, individuals apparently uh with the great knowledge about time travel and space uh, ships and things along that line had had made marginal uh, uh, notes about what they knew about the subject based upon i guess uh, what material was in the uh, in the book by dr jessup who later either committed suicide or or, or something strange happened to him because oh, his body wow. was found uh, yeah, in, uh, in, in a park, uh, he had died from carbon monoxide uh, uh, poisoning by putting a hose to the uh, the window of his uh, car and rolling up the uh, the uh, the window. But uh, the uh, this this company uh, uh, made uh, uh, about fifteen or twenty copies of this annotated uh, book, uh, especially for the uh, the Navy who wanted to, uh, to pass it uh, around to the. Uh, to the top of brass. Uh, also, and I don't know whether this uh, still goes on to this day. Remember, Tim, they, they had a wall chart that they used to have hanging on all the Navy uh, ships. It was, I believe, Janip 115 or 114. And it had Something all like sorts that, of yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, aircraft and ob objects that uh, 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 the men on, on deck should be on the alert uh, for and report if they saw and, and there were several different shapes of UFOs among Russian fighter planes and things along that line. You know, I mean, very, uh, very my, peculiar. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to, inter to interject, but my grandfather was a an officer in the Navy and was, you know, on many of the Korean War and, you know, a little bit in the beginning of Vietnam. But I wish he was alive to this day. I wish I could ask him. <laughs> that is just so fascinating. Um, that is something I wish I, I could kind of go back in time and ask him about that because that is amazing. And, you know, something I kind of want to say to that, to that note too, is that again, growing up in a government family, my dad worked for the government, and, you know, kind of growing up in a naval family as well. It, it is the Navy re recognizes credibility, credible threat, if you will, you know, that might not be like the, we never really say that UFOs, whenever people experience them, may they may not be threatening. But it is the Navy to take seriously things that they see out in the sky, out in the sea. You know, that so that is just fascinating to me. And that for me just makes all of this of what we're doing, you know, so much more credible and so much more interesting. And the fact that the Navy is validating it, the US government is validating it. Um, I just think it's so much more fascinating and it, it's just validating for everyone that is involved. And, and that's the thing is that the Navy, they take these things very seriously, you know, so they have to, you know, believe in an unidentified flying object, you know, that they just can't explain, you know, it's, it's interesting for us to think like, you know, that it's, oh, it's something you can kind of wave away, but you know, they, again, they take these things very seriously because if they could see it as a potential threat, they're going to want to study it. They're going to want to know everything they can about it. So that for me, it's the fact that they got Dr. Gessup's book, you know, specifically, you know, for the top brass, it doesn't surprise me, to be honest with you, because it is just something they just want to know everything, you know, there is to know about a topic if they can see it as a credible threat. Um, you know, so that is just very fascinating. Thank you for all that yeah, information. Now, Caitlin, why do you think, um, after all of these years, and we've seen all kinds of 
different UFO photos, and, and now we have uh, videos you can go on YouTube and, and see just all kinds of, of, of brightly lit uh, uh, close-ups of UFOs, you know, flying around, disappearing, you know, little gray guys coming out of the landing crafts. Why do you <laughs> yeah. think, after all this time, that the Trent photographs are are still pertinent that that you know not only do people still look at them and are fascinated by them but you know mm-hmm. you've uh, you've actually gone and built a ufo festival around them uh, you <laughs> yeah, know i mean right. you know why why are they so special you know that's a great question um it's one of those things where you know back in the day as we mentioned i mean it was in life magazine it was on you know the cover of this you know smaller town newspaper but you know it it was something that so many people, you know, decades later were kept going back to these photographs and kept thinking, okay, as the technology progresses, can I debunk these photographs? Can I, you know, see that they're, you know, not, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? So that they're not, you know, credible. I think that is what makes them so special is that so many people, uh, you know, 19... 19- 50s when they were taken in the 60s, in the 70s, even to this day, people are still trying to debunk these photographs. And so I think that is something that, you know, again, we keep going back to. It's it's kind of, we, you got to go back to your roots in a way. You know, it's, it's these photographs almost created, as I say, like the stereotypes of like the flying saucer. You know, I know that's not where the term comes from. It comes from, you know, up in uh, the Thames Arnold, but it's just a really interesting Thing to think about that these Trent photographs, you know, with as technology advances and, you know, Jeremy McCorgall actually last year at our festival talked a lot about this, you know, how there is this phenomenon that now we have a camera at our disposal at all times. We almost, to be honest with you, don't always see what's around us. I am a perfect example of this. You know, we're all, you know, examples and guilty of this is that you drive in your car, you're going the same place every day, back and forth and back and forth. And I can get there and not even remember how I got there. But the fact that, you know, this kind of object came out into the sky, you know, and Evelyn Trent saw this and was like, no, this is strange. We need to kind of go out of our way you know, to take this photograph and then, you know, they kind of forgot about it. And I just think that for me, you know, then to remember them years later and just be like, this is what we saw. If you believe us, great. If not, you know, too bad, because this is what we saw and we believe in what we saw. And I think that kind of is at the heart of it as well, is that they just never wanted anything. They never wanted money. They never wanted fame. And a lot of the times it's kind of, it can ruin people's lives, you know, if they've been an experiencer and if they've been an eyewitness. Um, have an eyewitness account. Um, And I just think kind of those points, you know, the technology as it advanced, they tried to debunk it. You know, we have all of these technologies on hand. And I just think it was something really special, like of its time that, you know, you're always looking to the skies and you're kind of always like living in the moment and like living in the day to day. And we just don't do that as much now. And so we're kind of trying to honor that and just you know, the fact that we all kind of come together and, you know, we do this as, you know, people have been coming since the beginning. And I think that's really special. And that kind of brings people back. And it's really, it was to honor these photographs that, you know, we did this. And so that's for us, it's just, it makes the event just that much more magical. And it's, you know, it's really changing the nature of UFOs and ufology, you know, today, as we see, you know, it's all about kind of what the government's capturing and, you know, and, and the high speed of it all and the radar and we can't capture their speeds and we can't, we can barely see them on like our radar screens, you know, but it was these people who were not out chasing UFOs. They were just in their backyard farmers, you know, very you know, simple, you know, not simple folk, but, you know, they're very humble folk and they just so happened to see this flying disc in the sky. And I just think that's, there's something really special about that. Um, and so that's, you know, why we come together in wine country, you know, McMinnville, Oregon, you know, every year, and you've been doing it for so long. So it's just something really special. And again, it's, it's still, it is kind of still a small town, you know, festival. Again, cost, pet costume contest, parade. It's just, there's something really great about it. And we really bring the community, you know, together every year as well. So the ESO community and the McMinnville community and the greater McMinnville, you know, community. So. Yeah, we're, we're very happy with it. And this year is just, again, going to be 
spectacular. So. All right. Well, we've only got about three minutes left in the program. So again, yeah. why don't you let our audience know uh, when this festival uh, uh, takes place and, you know, like when does the uh, parade start and, uh, you know, just uh, maybe a couple of the, the, the highlights that you want to mention before we have to go. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for uh, letting me do this. Um, so UFO Festival, it's the McMillan's UFO Festival. It's going to be Thursday, May 16th um, through Sunday, May 19th. Um, our VIP tickets start at $90. Um, and any event, you can purchase tickets to any um, singular event, $20 in advance, 25 day of. It's just easy to remember, you know, our URL uflfest.com super easy um so as always the parade is going to be on saturday and it's actually a later time than it has been in the last uh, few years so it's going to start at 3 30 so you don't want to miss that it's just the whole city shuts down it's pretty spectacular um so yeah a couple of our highlights of the festival this year bob lazar is going to be on saturday morning at 9 30 where um, they're going to be showing the area 51 and flying saucers with jeremy corbell um, and george knapp and doing a little Q&A with uh, Bob Lazar. It's going to be awesome. It's in the McMinnville Community Center is where all of our big speaker events. Um, also, uh, excuse me, we're going to have Peter Davenport from the National UFO Reporting Center and uh, Jim Clarkson from the Washington MUFON doing um, kind of like a fun lunch uh, with the speakers. Um, and that is going to be uh, on Friday. And that is going to be spectacular as well, 11 a.m. Dan Myrick from, uh, excuse me, from, uh, the Blair Witch Project is going to be showing some clips of Skyman for a Friday night at 9.30. Uh, David Fravor is going to be talking about the Tic Tac UFO, fa- excuse me, UFO case um, Saturday at 1 p.m. And then Dave Politis from Missing 411, he'll be there um, Friday at 7 p.m. as well. So uh, it's just going to be a fun, we're going to have a lot of fun. You know, you're going to bring, drink an Alienator IPA that we brewed especially for the festival and, you know, have a glass of our you know, Peter, that we made to just sit back and kick back and enjoy the festival. So, again, UFOFest.com, um, and it's, again, Thursday, May 16th, so next week through Sunday, May 19th in McMinnville, Oregon. All right. Well, we are rapidly running out of time, Tim. Got about 30 seconds left. <laughs> I'm here with. I'm here with my pie pan, so uh, <laughs> I, but I, 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 I've eaten the pie and I'm ready to toss it into the air. But right. <laughs> anyway, I, I say in jest, <laughs> and and thanks for uh, coming on and telling us uh, the story of the uh, the Trent and Nick Mendel uh, UFO festival. Uh, we'd like to get out there at uh, sometime, maybe in the uh, future. I, I guess it will be uh, going on uh, uh, in years to uh, come, and. Uh, Tim, I think we should uh, mention that we've got a new issue of the uh, printed version of the Conspiracy Journal uh, that's uh, out with all our latest uh, titles and uh, titillating, uh, uh, on many titillating uh, subjects. Uh, and if anybody wants to get a copy, they can uh, just drop me a line at mrufo8 at hotmail.com and I'll zip them off one in the uh, mail and send them a PDF as uh, well. So it's always free, free, free here. But buy some of our books, uh, keep us in business, and keep us rolling like you have for since 1965. That's when I first first started this uh, insanity. And I will continue uh, to do it up to the very last. You've been listening to Exploring the Bazaar with hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz. They're taking back the night by jetting non-stop across the cosmos in search of the truly bizarre and totally unexplained with you as their co-pilot. Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. For more information on exploring the bazaar and hosts Timothy Beckley and Tim Swartz, check out their KCOR digital radio network. Follow their YouTube channel at MRUFO1100. Exploring the bazaars.